All right, we can go ahead and get started right now. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Hello, hello, super exciting just to see how many people are here on this call um, or on this webinar. I am Rachel Quo, and I'd like to invite you to our conversation on feminist abolition and transformative justice. This public event is part of the Building an Asian American Feminist Movement Network Gathering, co-hosted by the Asian American Feminist Collective and 18 Million Rising for the 2020 Allied Media Conference. I'm super appreciative of our network gathering co-organizers, Laura Lee, Bianca Nozaki Nasir, Tiffany and Tiffany Dianso, who is supporting the back end of this event, as well as our co-leaders from AAFC, Saloni Bauman, Julie Kim, Santi Sojwal, and also Turner Willman, who is with 18 Million Rising. Um, we're really grateful to Nadine Marshall and the team of Allied Media of the Allied Media Conference in supporting this network gathering, as well as to our friends at Equality Labs and the South Asian Power Building Network Gathering for co-sponsoring this event with us. I'd like to thank our interpreters, Coco Chino and Nora Rodriguez. Um, and if you need to pin them, they have their names as um, interpreter. So you can see when they're switching off and then we'll drop their contact information into the chat box for any deaf and hard of hearing participants um, in case you want to give feedback or vocabulary preferences directly to the interpreters. If you need live captioning, we're using stream text supported by caption access, and you can find the stream text link here um, so you could follow the captions live and we'll drop that directly into the chat as well. So this event brings together a conversation about the vision and practice of abolition, a world without police, prisons, or cages of any form. Abolitionist organizing builds upon generations of work by Black feminist theorists, and we're excited to bring forward a conversation on feminism, abolition, and transformative justice to reimagine how, to re how we think through accountability for harm in order to build a world where all people can thrive and be well together. While we are on Zoom and many of us are joining from different places, we want to remind ourselves that we are gathered on the unceded land of the Indigenous peoples. And for those in New York City, where the Asian American Feminist Collective is located, Lenape Hoking and the land of the Lenape people. The legacy of transatlantic slavery and the long history of anti-Blackness in the United States has been tied to the theft of people to stolen land, which has been modernized to include the expansion of prisons and the militarization of police occupying unceded lands. Early carceral technologies included the dis displacement of Native people off of sacred lands into reservations. And so abolition necessitates decolonization. And we will have a further conversation on decolonization and anti-capitalism at our next event, which is on Friday, July 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern time at 1 p.m. Pacific time and 10 a.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. Our event today will feature about 40 minutes of conversation with our speakers and then we'll open up the floor to Q&A. Um, you're welcome to use the Q&A chat uh, feature or the chat feature on Zoom to ask questions throughout and we'll incorporate them into the end of the event. So I'll be asking questions that you share on chat in the Q&A directly to our speakers. And so without further ado, I'm super excited to introduce our speakers today, Leah Lakshmi Piepshna Samara Singha and Layla Raven. Leah is a queer disabled femme writer, story keeper, and disability and transformative justice movement worker of Burger, Tamil, Sri Lankan, and Irish Roma Ascent. She is the author or co-editor of many books, including Beyond Survival, Stories and Strategies from the Transformative Justice Movement, and Their Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Intimate Violence in Activist Communities. I came across her work almost 10 years ago while processing my own encounters with violence and her writing really introduced me to transformative justice. Their book Care Work, D Dreaming Disability Justice has also been an incredible resource in how we build movements and has been the foundation of the Asian American Feminist Collective's March scene, Care in the Time of Coronavirus. And I have all of my little library of Leah's books here. Um, so if you're interested, we can also like share that out as a future resource. Um, she's a writer of many other books, including Tongue Breaker, Dirty River, and Body Map. Um, Leah has also worked with the Allied Media Conference since 2009 as a co-creator of multiple transformative and disability justice tracks and the first iteration of Safety Team, AMC Support and Safety Crew. 
She is uplifting a GoFundMe for a mixed Native femme survivor of a domestic violence homicide attempt who needs permanent accessible housing. So that's where some of the donations from you all will go today. And we'll also drop the link to that GoFundMe in the chat if you would like to donate more, as well as the Disability Justice Culture Club, um, a community center uh, created by her longtime comrade and heart friend, Stacy Park Milburn in East Oakland, California. And we'll drop the donation link in here as well. And now I'd really like to introduce Layla. She's a queer mama, prison abolitionist, and community organizer from New York City. I feel really lucky to have met Layla recently through our work together in Eight to Abolition and being able to feel the light and love that radiates from her as she does this movement work with so much care and thoughtfulness. Layla is an organizer with Decrim New York, a collective of trans and queer, current and former sex workers and trafficking survivors working to, de to decriminalize, destigmatize, and decarcerate the sex trades in New York City and state. She previously organized with Decrim Now DC to end the criminalization of sex workers in Washington, DC. From 2015 to 2018, she served as the Executive Director of Collective Action for Safe Spaces, CAS, where she worked to develop comprehensive community-based strategies to address racialized and gendered harassment. In this role, she worked to build education programs like the Safe Bar Collective to equip bar and restaurant workers with strategies for intervening to stop harassment and prevent violence in nightlife. And she's partnered with the DC Rape Crisis Center and Rethink to create the Rethink Masculinity Program with and for masculine of center people to practice skills for interrupting oppressive behaviors and building healthier relationships. She is uplifting the Collective Action for Safe Spaces cast for donations today, where again, some of our donations from this event will go. And CAS is a Black, trans, and queer-led organization based in DC, um, working to build safer public spaces for everyone using community organizing, art, storytelling, and education. And again, we're gonna drop the caption link and also contact information for our interpreters into the chat for those of us who are just joining us. All right, so we're finally ready for questions. <laughs> so to get us started, one of the Asian American feminist collective's orientations to our feminist politics has been that we bring our histories to feminism. And similarly, I believe that we bring our histories to abolition as vision and practice. So I'm asking, can you please both share your entry points into abolition and transformative justice? What is abolition and transformative justice for you and how did you arrive here? And Layla, if you can start us off, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, I'm so happy to be here, um, especially, uh, you know, with Rachel, who I've been working alongside on Eta Abolition and also Leah, whose work and writing I've learned so much from. Um, so yeah, so what is abolition and transformative justice to me? Um, so abolition is about dismantling all carceral systems and building new ways of living and caring for each other. It's abolishing prisons, policing, the foster system, nursing homes, involuntary commitment in psychiatric institutions, and even the carceral and oppressive ways that we engage with each other in our everyday lives. Um, and that's also where transformative justice comes in. So transformative justice calls on us to move away from the framework that's offered by the criminal legal system. And, um, you know, while the legal system asks who's, who will be blamed and who will be punished for harm, transformative justice asks, how can we make things right? How do we shift the conditions that allowed harm to happen and what will make us safer? Um, so the criminal legal system is past oriented and punitive while transformative justice is future oriented and reflective. Um, and how I came to this work, um, I've been harmed by carceral systems over the course of my entire life, but it was really difficult for me to name that as harm and name carceral systems as even like causing trauma because I'd always been taught that these systems were helping me. So, um, you know, from a very young age, I had uh, interventions with the foster system. Um, I grew up in a very abusive household, ended up on the street, traded sex to access housing and to access resources, um, and got picked up multiple times by the police over that time and labeled as a chronic runaway. Um, and then later on in my early 20s, I ended up in an abusive relationship and had an experience where, um, you know, in self-defense, I grabbed a knife and uh, was arrested for 
assault with a deadly weapon um, for defending myself against my abusive partner. But most of those experiences weren't experiences that I shared because I didn't see them reflected in larger Main Street movements, um, whether those were movements to address trafficking or movements to address gendered violence. Um, and I thought it was just me. Um, I, it wasn't until much later that I came across particularly the work of Survived and Punished and especially Miriam Kaba um, and the art of Micah Bazant and, and started to learn about the stories of so many survivors like Marissa Alexander and C.C. McDonald and Risha Meadows, Cynthia Brown, or many of the survivors who are currently incarcerated um, for, you know, who were criminalized for uh, defending themselves against abuse, like Gigi Thomas, Alicia Walker, and Tracy McCarter. And um, hearing all of those stories helped me, you know, understand my experience as part of a larger pattern um, and understand that this state enacts and enables gender violence against black women, women of color, and trans people of color systematically. Um, and, you know, alongside that, around the same time as I, I came across um, the work of Survived and Punished, I also had recently become uh, the interim director of, at first and later the executive director of Collective Action for Safe Spaces in DC, which is the work that I'm uplifting. Um, and you know, in that role, one of my first, one of the first um, responsibilities I took on was helping to organize a roundtable on street harassment um, and tried to make sure that a lot of different people's experiences were uplifted. But at the time, I was told, you know, the solution to addressing street harassment was um, uh, data collection and training and um, I, I still think that that's true, that, you know, we need that data collection and that we do need more education and public art to address street harassment. But as I heard more and more, um, especially Black, trans, and queer folks testifying, um, I heard a lot of experiences of harassment directly by police um, and harassment of, you know, sex workers, harassment uh, for, for evading fares to access public transit um, because of just lack of access to, you know, the basic things that we need to survive. And it helped me broaden my understanding of um, what street harassment even meant or what gendered violence looked like and all of the different ways that um, both the state and um, people <laughs> uphold the, the um, uphold patriarchal oppression and the work of the state, do the work of the state in our everyday lives. Um, and yeah, so um, just learning more and more of people's experiences and seeing the work that had already been done um, was really incredibly affirming to me and, and brought me to abolition and transformative justice. Hi, um, this is Leah. I am a light brown skin person with long brown curly hair that's also gray, who looks underslept, um, who's wearing a red lace shirt, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, this is a six million dollar question, right? Um, I think it's always important to say um, that my entry point into um, transformative justice work happened before transformative justice was a word. Um, I think that like a lot of other folks who got into TJ or community accountability, or sometimes I just like calling it non-state based approaches to dealing with violence and harm in the 90s, um, I got thrown into it because I was in an abusive relationship. And I, I think it's important to lift it up because it's really wild to me now, you know, 20 some years later that I'm like, oh my God, transformative justice is a word in the New York Times. 25 years ago, people were all like, you're nuts. You don't want to call the cops. <laughs> Not everybody, but a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I got involved because like a lot of survivors, I had to save my own life. And I was in an abusive relationship with someone who I loved, who was another mixed race um, person of color who was non-binary, who'd done time in the juvenile justice system, who was my immigration sponsor. And I was in a really, 
a, a matrix that I think is familiar to a lot of people of like, wow, I thought this was the love of my life and it was this transformative relationship and we're both trauma survivors and they're not handling it well and things got physical and I'm really scared. And I couldn't call the cops. And when, you know, people in our shitty building called the cops on us because we're having a huge fight at two in the morning, um, the first, you know, they didn't ask me for help. They, they asked my partner, you've done time, right? And they looked at me and they said, what's your immigration status? And that is one of the many reasons why transformative justice was born. Um, you know, I, we all, a lot of us who came into this work in the 90s are Black, Indigenous, and POC feminists who honestly were just ordinary survivors who were like, I cannot depend on the systems and I need to figure some shit out. <laughs> um, we didn't have a guidebook, but what we did have was our own survival knowledge, um, our own lived black and brown feminist smarts. And something that Ijeris Dixon, who's my longtime comrade and the co-editor, the other co-editor of Beyond Survival, and has been doing black queer feminist anti-violence work in New York and nationally for 20 years says often is that we actually have histories in our communities um, going back hundreds of years of dealing with violence without with dealing with violence without the police. We might have to dig for them. They might be imperfect, but they're there. Like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to kind of unbury the wheel because, you know, black and brown anti-feminist and not anti-feminist, anti-violence feminist strategies get buried by the powers that be. So I think it's important to say that when I came into it, I, TJ wasn't a word, but what I did have was I had my, you know, small group of, you know, other black and brown young femmes who, after I got out of the relationship and my ex was still everywhere in political community, they would be like, every event we went to, you know, whether it was going to the club or going to the Prison Justice Film Festival, they'd be like, okay, we're going to go inside and we're going to see if he's there. And if he's there, we're going to come out and tell you. And we've got choices. We can go in and mean mug him. We can tell him to leave. We can go someplace else with you. And I just want to lift that up because my definition of transformative justice is, it's really broad. It's any intervention that creates more safety, justice, and or healing by and for survivors of violence that does not primarily rely on the state or the police. It's not about yelling at people when they're like, I called 911, I had no idea what else to do. It's acknowledging that we are all in a really shitty world working with inadequate tools and that also we are incredibly innovative. And I wanna say that because I think sometimes, you know, in 2020, people hear transformative justice and they think of one thing, which is, oh, that's when you sit in a circle with your rapist and you try and get them to transform. And I wanna say it can be that. And it also can be when you're at the bus stop and somebody's harassing somebody and you go, hey, can you shut the fuck up? Or it's when you make yourself available to friends or people in your community who are like, hey, I have this really bad situation and I can't tell anybody, can I talk to you? Or it's when you do community safety, like Ijeris and many other people have done for years, going back to the Safe Outside the System Collective in 2005, that was organizing against stranger violence and police violence against Black queer people in Bedside, and went to bodegas and was like, hey, can you be a safe space where if someone's fleeing this virus, this violence, um, you can be a safe haven? Because they knew that bodega owners often already have baseball bats behind the counter because they're not going to call 911. Um, so that's my short version of what TJ is. And I want to say that often I think the focus, people think, oh, you mean transforming the person who caused the harm or abuse? And I'm like, yeah, sometimes. And sometimes I want to lift up, it's also about transforming the lives of us as survivors. Um, I also, really quickly, I want to say I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and family abuse. And I grew up in a lower middle class, upper working class, mixed race family, where it was very much like, don't call the cops. You, you know, if you tell anybody foster care is going to come in, et cetera. And when I did confront my family about the violence, um, they very much responded with a, you're crazy and we're going to get you help with the threat of forced psychiatric incarceration. And thankfully at the time I had hooked up with the psych survivor movement in Toronto and I had language and community around opposing forced psychiatric internment, right? Um, but out of those experiences, it gave me a really great love for survivor wisdom and for those of us who are criminalized as survivors and who also face ableism and are labeled as crazy and threatened with psychiatric in, you know, institutionalization, that we don't, those systems are, can be really harmful and we have our own skills, we have our own wisdom. Um, I don't, I think I trailed off, but I think you get the gist. 
Um, basically that like, I think there's an important connection to me between anti-ableist work and TJ, even though I didn't have those languages in 1990, where I was like, we can just get together as peers who, who are labeled as crazy and survivors and figure this stuff out. That's it, I'm gonna stop talking, thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing these stories and really sharing how many folks come into abolition through intimate encounters with violence. And often that there's a lot of experimentation that happens in terms of how we find solutions for healing after harm collectively. So I really appreciate that. I want to honor and uplift that. Um, a big goal of our network gathering is building a feminist movement that's rooted in our different yet intertwined experiences and histories in order to push for collective liberation. And I really love that Mariam Kaba has said, I'm an abolitionist because I'm a feminist. And Angela Davis has also said that abolition needs feminism. And so I'd love if you could both talk a little bit about how abolition and transformative justice connect with your feminist politics. And Leah, if you can get us started on that question, that would be great. Absolutely. Okay, um, so I think when we're talking about abolition and feminism, I mean, I think the question that comes up for me is like, yeah, what feminism are we talking about? Are we talking about white feminism that in many ways took over the anti-violence movement in the 70s and 80s and really was like, oh, if we just get the police to get on our side, we'll end rape, we'll end domestic violence. Or, you know, are you talking about Black, Indigenous, and POC, and sex worker, and, and disabled, and everything, survivor feminism, right? Um, because we know that, you know, the cops were created to punish us. So we actually, calling them is always going to be something that ends up with very mixed results. And a lot of us know that cops are rapists. Like, that's my thing when people are like, especially recently, are like, what are you going to do with the rapists? I'm like, talk to any sex worker, talk to any kid on the street. Cops are rapists. Like, it's not, it's built in. And there's a blue line of silence that protects them, right? So for me, when the roots of my feminism are rooted in black and brown and indigenous feminisms, right? And they're rooted in feminisms that name that, you know, when the Indian Act, you know, was created, it created conditions of domestic violence in indigenous communities because it was like, oh, you have to be married to one person and you can't just leave, right? Um, it names that police come out of the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, the original police were people who were slave catchers of enslaved African people. Um, I think as a mixed race South Asian and Sri Lankan person, it's really important for me to acknowledge how much we have learned and, you know, really have gotten from Black feminism and really give respect to that and accountability to that. I also want to, I think sometimes in Asian American communities, there can be this kind of void where we don't learn our own histories of, you know, Asian American, Asian diasporic, Asian broadly defined, you know, radical gender organizing. So I, the examples I think of when I think of, just to name just a few of like radical Asian transformative justice work, go back to um, Pony House in Jaffna, Sri Lanka, which was founded by Rajani Thuranagama, who is, some people may know as a Tamil feminist heroine. Um, Purani means the whole woman. And this is a domestic violence shelter that it was not funded by the state. It was a bunch of Tamil and other women who just like took over someone's house and was like, this is going to be a refuge. And they did it in the middle of the Civil War, right? Um, my friend Mina Hershola named that there's a women's court in Gujarat where because the courts were so corrupt, a bunch of old women were like, we're going to meet under this banyan tree and settle things. Um, she has roots in Fiji, so she talked about the concept of Talanoa, which is a community meeting to uh, work out and resolve harm, where people sit down together and talk for days until the matter is resolved, right? These are just a few examples of things we've done. Um, and then when you compare that to things like ESCOM, like or Safer Communities, which is a policy that federally went through around 10 years ago, where it was like, okay, great, we're going to link up ICE with the police. And what that meant for survivors is that if someone, if you or someone else is in domestic violence and you call the cops or someone calls the cops on you, they automatically link the report to ICE. So if you are undocumented, if you have a record, if your partner's undocumented, then all of a sudden you're someone who's surviving violence, but ICE is showing up at your door wanting to support, wanting to deport you, right? 
Um, that's not my feminism, right? That's not my feminism. And I don't, as a disabled brown person, I don't believe that the police can be reformed. Um, I want to lift up the work of Leroy Moore of Crip Hop Nation, who's the Black disabled activist who has been doing work about police violence and murder of Black disabled folks for years. And it's like, we've had three million training sessions and sensitivity workshops to the police. It does not work. It is a band-aid on gangrene. Um, and I think that just from a practicality point of view, I would rather put energy and lift up the work of everybody from, you know, like anti-violence strategies that, you know, I, we can look at sex workers creating bad date lists, right? Or, um, you know, Support New York, which is a coalition that worked for years in New York City around TJ. Um, I want to lift up many APA like feminists who are foundational to TJ work, like Mimi Kim, Creative Interventions, Mata Hari, um, Chin Yi Chen and Jai Dulani, who co-edited Revolution Starts at Home, um, to API Chaya today, which is an Asian Pacific Islander anti-violence group in Seattle, that among other things has kind of been like, wow, a lot of people are trying transformative justice and struggling and often feeling like, did I fail at it? Why is that? Is it because TJ is fundamentally flawed? Maybe not. Maybe it's because they were thrown into a situation where they had no mentorship or support. And Chaya just rolled out a program this year where they're like, hey, you know, do you want to learn about TJ and get mentored and get supported in holding your processes? Hello, we have created a project for you where you can get that. Um, I'll stop there. But yeah, um, basically, no white feminism, instead BIPOC anti-state feminism, I think is the gist. Yes, thank you for that, Leah. Um, yeah, for Black women and women of color, we can't separate our experiences of gendered violence from our experiences of state violence. The state often enacts gendered violence against us or criminalizes us for surviving uh, violence, just like Leah was saying, and also rapists and abusers are carrying out the work of the state to uphold patriarchal oppression when they engage in gendered violence. So these two forms of oppressive violence are interconnected and reinforce each other. Um, so my feminist politics always has to be abolitionist. Um, but yeah, most directly, I think this happens when uh, gendered violence is perpetrated by state actors. We know that sexual assault is the second most common form of police brutality, primarily targeting black women and women of color, and especially those who are already facing heightened state surveillance and criminalization like sex workers and drug users. Um, and also police officers are two to four times more likely than the general public to be domestic abusers. Um, and on top of that, like Andrea Ritchie has pointed out in her work, um, many police practices like strip and cavity searches are forms of state sanctioned sexual assault. So abolition of prisons and policing in itself is a strategy to address gendered violence. And that's been really important to highlight in my work to decriminalize sex work in New York and in Washington, DC. Um, I think in the past, sex workers rights organizers have often leaned heavily on language like sex work is not sex trafficking. And that's a slogan that even I have used in the past um, as though we could draw a clear line between the two when the reality is that many of us who have traded sex to access resources have actually experienced violence and exploitation in the sex trades. So instead of arguing that, you know, decriminalization is for sex workers and criminalization is for survivors, we really have to be emphasizing that criminalization hurts all of us. Um, and a lot of the anti-trafficking laws that have been proposed um, just increase criminalization and increase funding for policing, but do nothing to support survivors or to address the root causes that lead people into exploitative or violent situations in the sex trades in the first place. So, um, you know, for example, my experience, I was a teen trading sex to access housing after experiencing sexual violence in the foster system. Um, and I didn't see myself as a sex worker back then because I just didn't have that language. But the law, federal law, defines my experience and all experiences of young people in the sex trades under the age of 18 as child sex trafficking victims. Um, despite the fact that 85% of young people in the sex trades don't have a third party exploiter, they're working on their own. Um, so there are often no traffickers to target. And instead, many young people are experiencing homelessness because they're fleeing abuse, experiencing family rejection over their um, queer or trans identities. 
fell through the cracks of the foster system, or like in my case, some combination of those factors. So addressing root causes looks like ensuring trans and queer youth are affirmed and supported at home, or ensuring that young people who need to leave home have access to safe alternative housing, which is something that was really important to me that we built into the ATA abolition platform. Um, so centering survivors in the movement for decriminalization starts with ensuring that survivors have access to the things that we need, safer housing, health care and an end to the criminalization of our survivor strategies and um you know just like leah was saying earlier like that that's what transformative justice about is about meeting the needs of survivors ensuring the safety of survivors thank you both so much for sharing these really deep and personal ways that you've come into feminism and the importance of centering survivors as we do this work of dismantling harm and thinking about accountability. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, I have questions for each of you. And so Leah, I've gushed about your book, Care Work, earlier, and it seems like care is something that's really coming through in both what you and Layla are talking about, right, and how we are centering survivors and how we do this work. And also, when you talk about care and mutual survival, you're really demonstrating the centrality of disability justice at the core of our movements and how we build these communities of resistance. And I also personally really love your reflections and thinking about how we build for the long haul. Both, it sounds like both you and Layla have been doing this work for a really long time, right? And that there's this kind of way that we can push against urgent temporalities as we think about building together for, a lo for the long haul and also making sure we're not leaving folks behind. And so can you talk a little bit more about the principles and vision of disability justice as they lead um, abolition, as they lead into your abolition work? Yes, I can do that. Um, hold on, I'm gonna do this thing where, okay, great. Zoom is working. Okay, so I could talk all day about this. So thank you for asking. Also, Layla, thank you for being brilliant and for everything you're sharing. I appreciate you so much. Um, Okay, so first of all, I just wanna say that survivor issues are disability issues, right? Survivors are disabled. There are so many disabled survivors. There are survivors who are physically disabled, deaf, deaf blind, blind, chronically ill, neurodivergent, um, you know, living with mental health disabilities, um, more chronically ill, I already said that, um, all of the above. And, you know, there's no separating our disabilities from our survivorhood experiences. And because of ableism, so often, both in mainstream anti-violence world, in the world in general, and in TJ world, um, disability's kind of been forgotten about, you know, and that's a classic way ableism manifests, and we, we it's gotta stop, it stops now, okay? Thank you. Um, you know, I mean, survivors, so many survivors have PTSD, that's a disability, right? Um, so for me, first of all, disability justice in TJ work means asking from the moment we do the work, how are we centering disability? And that's a nice phrase that it's easy to knock your head at, but I'm going to give some examples. Um, so first of all, there's so many resources, especially now, being made um, around transformative justice and by and for survivors and people who caused harm, and so many of them are inaccessible, right? Um, when we make infographics and there's no text description or captions, you know, there's so many people who can't access those things. When we have webinars um, or podcasts and there's no transcript, there's no cart, there's no ASL, so many people can't access those things. Um, and then going forward from media, I mean, I'm just thinking about the way a lot of I've seen TJ be done, which is you hear that something's happened, there's a rape, there's an assault, and people are like, oh my God, we gotta go, we gotta be on emergency mode. And it's like, go, 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 eight hour meetings that happen right at seven o'clock, where if you're a parent, you're trying to get your kid to go to bed, or, and there's no breaks, there's no access check-in, it's just emergency, and then people crash, right? Um, I think sometimes when people are new to disability justice or thinking about ableism, especially if we are coming from scarcity, you know, um, resource wise, there can be this feeling of like, oh, if we make things accessible, nothing will get done. That's inefficient. But actually, if things are inaccessible, it's really inefficient. It's inefficient. It doesn't actually solve abuse when you go real hard for your friend, for your friend who's a survivor or the person you just met for three days and then you crash because the pace is so wild. Um, so I think, you know, building an access where you do an access check in at the beginning of your meeting, 
you know, you really, you're like, oh, are people getting burnt out? Let's talk about this and let's figure out what's sustainable in terms of this intervention, right? There's so many survivors who are like, I actually need a minute to process what the hell I want. And feel, I've heard so many survivors say, I feel guilty about that. You know, I'm being a bad survivor because I need a minute. That's bullshit, you know? Um, so I think pace is really important. Um, I think pace and sustainability is a disability justice issue in TJ. Um, and I also want to say that often when people hear that, I think they have an impression, oh, you know, disabled people, we're real slow. You know, everything takes 19 years, you know? And what I want to say is actually, I mean, sometimes that's true and it's great. Um, I know a lot of disabled people who have snail tattoos because it's a, you know, form of pride for us. But it's also true, I, I think what's more accurate is that as disabled people, we have so much disabled knowledge about energy or spoons management because, if you only have enough energy to go to the bathroom, make one meal and do one more thing, you're gonna be really smart about how you use your energy. So sometimes I've seen disability justice led interventions and violence where people go, we're not gonna drag this up forever. We're gonna do these three things that are, that we can do, that we can hold. And that's what we're gonna do, right? We're gonna move real quick. And, um, you know, I, Disabled people deal with emergencies all the time. Like, I mean, you know, we're at the food stamps office trying to make it work, you know? And um, wait, really important point. So that's one thing um, I think, oh yeah, I remember my point and I'll just say two more things and then wrap up because I think my five minutes is almost up. Um, I wanna say that often in TJ, I use something that a lot of people, especially I've seen Survived and Punished call this out recently and I really appreciate it and I wrote this whole epic Facebook comment, there's kind of been this assumption that TJ is held by this unending, unpaid pool of femme, mostly femme, survivor labor, that we just work 3,000 hours for free, and that, you know, our energy, who cares? And I think with disability, we know that energy matters because we only have five spoons or chunks of energy a week. So I think that one way that disability justice can come into TJ work is actually being like, what can we actually hold that doesn't destroy us, right? Um, I've seen some survivors lately who, you know, a couple times publicly have posted things or circulated statements where they're like, so there's a serial abuser in the community and we really tried in good faith to be like, hi buddy, you wanna change? And after two years, three years, four years of this person being like, sort of, and then being like, oh, just kidding, I'm going to be manipulative and shitty. Um, you know, they're just like, we're not willing to put any more energy into this. So instead, we're going to make a statement saying, hey, here's our experiences with this person being violent and causing harm. We want to share them. You can make your own decision about what you want to do with this information. But we're done trying to get the asshole to change. You know, like, we're going to go take care of ourselves now. And we're going to put this information out there. That does not have to be, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the, you know, the online verse about call outs are bad. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Sometimes it can be bullying. I mean, anything can be a lot of things. But I think sharing information about, hey, this person's been violent for a long time to multiple people and really weaponize social justice language to cover it up. Make your own decision, but we just want to give you a community safety alert. That's important. And that's like a very elegant use of spoons. Um, I think, oh, last thing really quick. Um, many people don't understand, it's very important to understand that many disabled survivors, we're being abused by people who give us care. You know, and we're being told, oh, you're not desirable because you're a cripple, so you have to put up with it. If you want to intervene to support disabled survivors, you have to understand that this could be our lover, it could be a paid caregiver, it could be our aunt we live with who's abusing us and is also making sure we go to the bathroom when we get our meds. You have to, if you want to support us, you have to know that and you have to help us figure out on our own terms, where are you really going to get that care if that abusive caregiver is not there. Last, disabled communities, sometimes they're very good at really not, we've experienced disposability, so we're like, we're not going to throw people away. But that doesn't mean that people can just do whatever the hell they want. We can be like, hey, I know you've been disposed of by the communities that are out there because of ableism. And you did that shitty thing, I'm still gonna say that's not okay. We understand really holding each other with compassion and also consequences. And I think sometimes when people are talking about TJ, they just hear, well, you know, everyone's harmed each other and kind of they go to a place of, so that means we just have to let them do it. Unless, and, if, and if we say, oh no, consequence, that means we're the state. I've seen disabled people sometimes be really good at being like, we're not the state and, you know, I'm not going to throw you away. And also that was fucked up. And I don't know if you can come over to my house right now until you fix it. 
I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for these reflections. And I think actually to your last point on disposability as well, I think that offers a really helpful transition and provocation to my question for Layla. And Layla, I know the heart of your work really is about centering survivors of gendered violence. And I see the ways that you bring that forward in your work, especially in emphasizing how we build in processes of accountability for harm without punishment, while also prioritizing safety and healing for survivors as well. And we have gotten some questions like this from the audience as well but I'd love if you could talk a little bit more about these community-based processes that you've seen in your different organizing homes and what accountability without punishment looks like in our communities and movement spaces. Yes, of course. And just thank you so much, Leah, for um, talking about, you know, the fact that, yeah, setting boundaries to keep people safe is not disposing of abusers and rapists uh, and consequences are not punishment. I think those distinctions are really important and often get lost. Um, as many of us have been working toward building abolitionist futures, I, you know, like Leah said, we often get the question, what about the rapists? And as I've been supporting survivors in accountability processes and, and recently went through my own uh, uh, process with an editor of the now shuttered commune magazine, I've been trying to lift up the question, what about the abusers? Um, Many of us are still navigating the realities of interpersonal violence and abuse. Um, and it's truly the biggest heartbreak and betrayal when it happens in organizing spaces, because often those abuses, abuses come directly from those who have all the right language about abolition, revolution, and even transformative justice, but are still replicating a lot of the same patterns and behaviors of the oppressive, oppressive systems that they claim to seek, they seek to dismantle. Um, so that has really helped me move away from this idea that we just need to better educate abusers or hold their hands through healing and transformation. And it's helped me move toward um, working to shift the burden of dealing with the consequences of abusers' actions off of survivors and back to those abusers who, in the current context, often actually benefit from abusing others. Um, consequences don't naturally occur in a cis heteropatriarchal society um, that actually promotes and encourages abuse and oppressive behavior. Um, so we have to actively work to disrupt those oppressive behaviors and create consequences to keep people safe. Um, and what's happened instead is that, uh, like Leah was saying earlier, in many radical spaces, accountability processes have been seen as the alternative to the criminal legal system to respond to gendered violence. And I think that speaks to the incredible work of the many feminist abolitionist organizers over the past few decades who have popularized this strategy. But you know, it's also important to remember, as I have learned from Miriam Kaba and Shira Hassan, that a process is not always what's needed, and it's not always helpful or healing for survivors. Um, and what I've seen with survivors navigating processes with abusers is that a lot of the same abusive patterns get replicated in the accountability process. So the process becomes an extension of the abuse itself, um, and apologies get worked in as a performance, just like in the reconciliation stage of abusive relationships. Um, and I've also seen and experienced processes used to silence survivors or to deter survivors from seeking forms of justice that might be more satisfying or more healing. Um, and as my friend Hejin Shim, the co-founder of Survived and Punished has said, accountability processes have in many ways just replicated the courtroom in our communities. Um, so I've worked alongside survivors in building alternative strategies that focus more on our healing and our safety and transforming the conditions that allowed abuse to occur in the first place. Um, for example, by calling for accountability from the collectives and the organizations that have protected and enabled abuse, instead of just counting on abusers to choose to be accountable. Um, I think the harm in that is, you know, one, when we focus only on abusers, that individualizes a problem that's actually a community problem. 
Um, and we also end up just giving too much power to abusers to continue their harm. So I think it's important to call on collectives and organizations to build structures and practices to prevent and address abuse. And I've really been grateful to see collectives like Out of the, the Woods and Pinko Magazine respond to my experience with Commune by starting their own work internally to build those practices. So instead of, you know, just pointing and saying like, oh, they fucked up, we have to be looking inward and saying, what are the ways that we are working to be accountable to prevent and address uh, harm from happening in our own community and our own organization? Um, so I've been involved in multiple public calls for, pub uh, for accountability over the past few months, for example, with Commune Magazine that no longer exists because that was part of my process, um, and the Hella Black podcast. And I'm also on the support team for two survivors who have been speaking out about cops and abusers in our organizing spaces in New York. And these processes have all focused on deplatforming abusers and removing them from roles that were built on hypocrisy um, and used to prey on people. Uh, and while those efforts to deplatform abusers have been very healing for the survivors that I've, I've organized with and for myself, we also have all experienced a lot of backlash, retaliation, doxing in my case. Um, and it's a reminder that we all still have so much work to do to create a context where survivors are not silenced but encouraged to speak out about our experiences and we start to see public calls for accountability as invitations and opportunities to transform harmful behaviors and come back to integrity. Um, so I also appreciate Leah uh, bringing up, you know, the um, some of the language that we've seen floating around about call out culture and I want to address, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown's recent piece on call out culture which poses all of these questions about whether or not a process has been used or tried before we mobilize to ensure that our abusers in, uh, experience consequences for their actions. Um, and I, you know, and I know that a lot of other survivors shared my feelings about it. We found it um, really erased a lot of the care, compassion, and labor that survivors put into our public calls for accountability and also many of the uh, private calls for accountability that happened before that. Um, and it, it seems to seek to dissuade survivors from coming forward and echo a lot of the messages that we get already from the dominant culture that we just need to give our abusers one more chance to change their behavior. Um, when the reality is, again, that abusers often benefit from their abusive behavior. They reap the short-term benefits of having their partner cater to all of their emotions and needs. Um, and often they also have, they also maintain access to power and access to roles where they're able to continue to prey on people, manipulate people and cause more harm. Um, and I think this also speaks to uh, the harms of like celebrity culture and organizing spaces. Um, like once someone reaches a sort of celebrity status in our organizing spaces, and I think this is true for institutions as well, they become sort of above critique and above accountability. And those who do call for accountability are the ones who are silenced and pushed out and discarded. And I've seen this pattern uh, play out with multiple organizations, um, including some of the organizations that have been on the front lines of some of the incredible work on abolition. And I've seen these organizations replicate the same patterns of abuse. And it doesn't show up in the form of a call out, but through invisible power structures and whisper networks so that um, if you ask them either privately or publicly to be accountable, they use their networks to spread rumors, um, vague rumors about harm you've caused, shut you out of organizing spaces. I've seen this play out with multiple accountability processes when survivors were getting ready to, you know, or even before even considering speaking out about the harm and abuse they experienced. Um, there was already a narrative that was crafted by abusers or by abusive organizations. Um, and so, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown's piece refers to callouts as the master's tools, but I'd argue that the master often uses the tools of gaslighting, invisible power structures, whisper networks, and platforms where they become above accountability, while those who are oppressed 
are the ones who protest and organize and call out and mobilize for change. Um, those who are fighting back against oppression use a diversity of tactics. And I think we should respect a diversity of tactics in resisting all forms of oppression, including when it shows up in our interpersonal relationships. And I think even, you know, about my own experience, like I, you know, with my first abuser, I stabbed him. <laughs> um, and like, I, I feel that I, I used a lot of patience and care this time around to just write a letter about my feelings. Um, and I have experienced almost more shaming and backlash for a public call for accountability than even, you know, violence that I, I then was punished for. So it, it just often feels like no matter what survivors do, it's always, the onus is always on survivors to cater to the needs of the community that enables abuse and to the abusers. Um, and I would really love to see more processes, more transformative justice um, approaches that, again, focus on meeting the real needs, the safety needs, the healing needs and justice needs of survivors. Thank you so much, Leila. That was really lovely and helpful and I think is giving us a lot to think about. I do want to be mindful since it is 150 and that we have a lot of really great questions that have been coming up in both the chat and the Q&A. So I think my first question um, will be to both of you and a question that I had on my mind that I think kind of folds into a lot of what our audience is also thinking about. And I think that really begins with the ways that both of you are thinking about the transformation of, of relationships, right? Like whether that's relationships to ourselves, our loved ones, our friends, and our communities, and that this work is really rooted in that. And, and I think the other thing that one of the participants had observed and pointed out is that you're really emphasizing the importance of abolition and transformative justice being non-state based, right? Like that it isn't just building up state infrastructures, but really kind of thinking about how are we doing this community work in communities. And so kind of thinking about the different questions that we've been getting, can you share a little bit more about how this work can be practiced in the day to day in terms of how we practice care and accountability to each other and particularly how we build in both transformative justice and this notion of healthy relationships into our accountability processes if perhaps those processes didn't begin that way and how might some of this work also translate into something more sustainable in terms of resources by and for communities and I think that's a couple of questions wrapped up in that one so I do so I'll move it um, and maybe give these questions to Leah first and then cobble some more questions together for both of you. Totally. Layla, you're amazing. Thank you for everything you just said. I appreciate you so much. Okay, I'm gonna try and, uh, uh, I'm gonna try and answer the five questions. Um, first of all, I wanna say, and this is not some, oh, if you were abused, you automatically abuse thing. But for me as a survivor, I start with accountability for myself. I've had to really fight to access you know, therapeutic and other support so that I don't lash out at people, so that I don't practice what I learned growing up. And um, I really, and it's, it's work, like I'm not, I'm not some perfect person. I'm not somebody who's a survivor who never has, you know, snapped or yelled at somebody or been like, I'm feeling powerless, so I'm going to be a mean bitch. And especially in the last five years, um, as somebody who, like I'm somebody who has DID or some people also call it structural disassociation. I have some parts that broke up off inside when I was surviving very early CSA. Yep, I just came out. It's really hard to find qualified support around it. That's not some weird white guy. And it's been really life-changing for me to actually get the access support I need. So I can be like, oh, I've got new tools. So I don't, you know, act in ways I don't want to. And I'm not perfect and I'm practicing it. Um, yes, I can go over. Um, so I think that's important. I think another thing that I practice is, you know, um, figuring out discernment between being able to sit there and not be like, I didn't mean it, but really take it in when I, someone goes, hey, that kind of sucked, you know, what you did, or maybe you didn't intend it, but it hurt. And also as an autistic person, um, so much of the time as neurodiverse people, 
we get trained not to trust our own takes on what's happening. So we are really vulnerable to a lot of abuse because someone will be like, you did that thing. And we go, wait, did I? I don't know, did I? And we go, yes, yes, I did, I'm sorry. So having autistic black and brown queer community has really helped me figure out, oh, okay, here's where I need to be accountable. And that's actually someone being an ass and I don't actually have to accept them. And that's a work in progress. Um, some other things, I, pra I practice de-escalation skills a lot and I have done that throughout my life. Um, I wanna lift up Ijeris Dixon and Vision Change Win's um, really incredible new toolkit, Get Information. You can go to visionchangewin.com, I believe. It's an incredible toolkit about de-escalation de skills and community safety. For me, I just have done everything from, especially when I was younger, pulling my tits out and, you know, distracting people to acting like that crazy bitch and picking my nose to just being like, hey, I hear you. You seem really freaked out. Let's calm it down when somebody, I witness abuse on the street or, you know, in public. Um, and I think practicing those skills are really important. Finally, I want to say um, it's been important for me. I was somebody who was a survivor who got told when it was happening, oh, you're too much. You know, you and your partner are crazy and we don't want to hear your depressing stuff. Like that's, that's personal. Um, I tried to do my small part to be part of a culture shift where I am really, I put it out there to my friends. I'm like, hey, if, if something's going on in your relationship, talk to me. And I ask people, how's it going? Even when everything looks quote unquote fine, because there's enormous pressure in queer communities and in all communities to be like, oh yeah, everything's great. We have a perfect relationship and there's shame and embarrassment. And I ask for that too. And I also, in terms of sustainability, I try and practice a thing where I go, is this a good time? And where it's really okay to say, and to also take in, actually, I love you, but I, I'm totally, I, I'm tapped out right now. Can you go to another resource? Um, for years, I was just the, you know, kind of an unpaid crisis line and I got really burnt out and I didn't know how to value wanting to be there for other survivors and also take care of my vicarious trauma. And uh, finally, I do a lot of ritual. I do cleansing rituals, I take salt baths, I do protection rituals, I pray for people. Um, I give it up to spirit because spirit is bigger than us and spirit has a lot of fierce ancestors and really bitchy, awesome gods and goddesses who want to protect survivors. So, boom, that's it. There's more, but that's what I'm going to say now. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I always think about um, something that Shannon Perez Darby said. Uh, on a on one of the building accountability com, uh, accountable communities videos um, done by Barnard, and it was something like waiting for someone else to change their behavior was killing me. And and really like you know we have to be thinking about like self accountability. So um, you know I I try to I aim to be accountable uh, and and align my values with my actions. Um, in everything that I do, even in navigating abuse, like I wanted to interrogate um, what are the factors that led me here? What were, you know, what are the pieces that I can take responsibility for so that I can shift? And one of the things that I really um, learned about myself was like, I had really like deeply internalized capitalist depression, always looking to take responsibility for everything <laughs> um, and including, you know, everyone else. Um, but I think, you know, as black and brown, like sex workers, trans and queer folks, people who are disabled, people who have na navigated homelessness, um, we've always been shut out of state supports and we've always been targeted by state violence. And so we've always built and relied upon alternative networks of care to, to survive um, and to support each other. Um, and I think my, you know, self-accountability shows up most in in my parenting style um, and my approach to parenting. I, I tell my daughter often there are no bad people and only bad behaviors um, and instead of trying to feed bad behaviors with attention you know I don't use punishment instead I try to praise her good behaviors so I, I see that as prevention like I um, try to comment on how well she plays with other kids or how thoughtful she can be or how proud I am of how hard she works at um, practicing her reading or her writing or her, you know, making it all the way across on the monkey bars. Um, and when bad behaviors come up, instead of, you know, 
talking about them in a way that's past oriented and punitive or shaming, I try to talk to her about them in um, a way that's future oriented and reflective. So I focus on trying to help her learn um, why the behavior wasn't okay. And I encourage her um, to behave differently in the future. So I use a framework that I learned from Marty Langlin in um, Work to Address Street Harassment. Uh, and it's, it's an ABC statement. So A is name the behavior. B is tell the person how it makes you feel. And C is tell them what to do instead. So this works with street harassers, but it also works with toddlers. Um, so like with my daughter, I'll, I'll say things like, you know, um, I don't like that you like left your toys on the floor. Um, it, it makes me, um, or, you know, like it hurts or it hurts my feelings or hurts my foot when I step on a, a block or a Lego. <laughs> um, please make sure you clean up your toys in the future. Um, so I think that, you know, we can apply transformative justice and accountability to every aspect of our lives. Um, Thank you so much. And I know we're over time, so I just want to ask one more short question to both of you all. And if we can just do a short answer for this, that would be great. And again, for all the attendees, we will share out this recording and also notes and a list of resources after the event. Um, you've all gotten probably many emails from us, so this will be one more that has more of these resources. Um, but the closing question that I did want to ask, since we have gotten a lot of it from different folks, has been thinking about the ways that we can a, keep our movements accessible in language and practice and think about this as a collective revolution. What can people do to build and cultivate communities in order to keep having these conversations? And for example, like how might people find mentors in this work and or bring together their peers who may be new to some of these concepts and ideas around abolition and transformative justice? And so maybe just a short two to three thoughts that you might have on how people can cultivate community. Do you want me to start? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I saw that Vadi asked this question about how do I find especially disability justice mentors in a small community? And I want to, um, my friend Neve often says, you know, Crips love the internet. Disabled people love the internet. So I think it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I know so many disabled folks are isolated where we are. And there are online communities um, that pop up, you know, I mean, I I'm a big stand for sick and disabled queers, which has now kind of calmed down a bit, but that was like a actually North American and global network of sick and disabled queers, where a lot of people collectively pooled knowledge. I also am um, thinking about something that um, my friend and comrade Stacey Park Milburn said a lot, where she was like, we learn together, you know, it's something we figure out together, and that that's a disability justice way of learning, which kind of comes away from the, there's a mentor out there who knows everything, and I'm going to learn from them, which I don't think is what you're saying, but it's a very common way of thinking of mentorship. And Stacey was really into, as disabled people, we get to sit down together and pool our knowledge and learn collectively from each other. So what that means is, like, I think about what would it be like to just put out a call where you are being like, hi, are you sick and disabled? Um, and you want to learn about TJ or you're practicing TJ, let's have an online hangout, like let's have a study group, like let's pool our knowledge, let's start a Google Doc. That's how so many disability justice and transformative justice um, projects that I've known have started is someone just being like, are you disabled and you want to hang out? Let's do it. Um, and I really want to lift that up and it can be start by asking questions like locally or nationally. I also want to say that something that Chaya did that's really important. Um, I know a lot of people who've written about TJ who feel overwhelmed because they're like, I get a million emails being like, here's this shitty process that went to hell. Tell me what to do. And they're like, I'm just one person. I'm overwhelmed. I'm disabled. I'm tired. Um, and I, it makes me think about what API Chaya did, which is they were like, let's take it off you're this individual, you fix it for no money, to let's actually create a structure within a radical Asian Pacific Islander queer disabled anti-violence org, where it's like, let's get some money and pay people for internship, even a little bit. Let's create some structure, let's get some food. Um, let's do it together instead of just having it be individualized so we can support each other. 
So I'm wondering about, you know, where you are or is there like a national organization that you could reach out to and be like, you want to start this thing where it's a mentorship program, where there's some funding and some support for people to get that mentorship. I'll stop. Thank you. And Layla, if you want to take that question. Yeah, I don't have much to add, but um, echoing Leah, you know, I, I know a lot of people will say like the internet is not a community, but I have built so much community online um, and have learned so much from people that I connected with on Twitter. Um, so uh, yeah, the internet. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thank you again to our interpreters, Nora and Coco, and also our captioner, Debbie, and Caption Access. And thank you all for being amazing at attendees. Um, and so much thanks and gratitude for Leah and Layla for sharing these experiences, this knowledge with us. And we're so excited that you all got to share this hour with us today. And thank you again. And again, a plug for our event on Friday, the 24th, um, and we'll share out that information and resources later. Bye, everyone.